Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Mandy Smith from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mandy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bart. Sure. So, um, yeah, you are the director of education um, at the Rock Hall, which that's what the cool kids call it is the Rock Hall, right? Is that the short, <laughs> shortened version? Yeah. Yeah, that is. <laughs> Good. OK, just making sure. Um, so uh, I think a good way to start this off, um, because we're we're both in Ohio, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is mm-hmm. in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. But for people around the world, I think it is like internationally known what it is, obviously. But why don't you mm-hmm. maybe explain what the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is? And uh, and then we'll go into some other cool stuff about your job there. Sure. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame actually was uh It was founded in 1983 when a few Mm. industry folks like Jan Winner and Ahmet Erdogan got together and said, we need a Hall of Fame for rock and roll. (laughs) Uh, The first class was inducted in 1986, and we've inducted a class every year since. And then we actually opened a museum here in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1995. Uh, So Mm. there we celebrate our inductees, but also just really the whole story of rock history. So you'll see artifacts from people who have yet to be inducted. Wow. You know, to be honest, because I'm going into this not knowing a ton, I've been there. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. I went there maybe when I was like 16 or 17. So I don't know, 15 years ago. I thought it would be older than that. I thought it would have been around a lot longer than Mm -hmm. 83 and then the museum opening in 95. It's pretty cool. And I mean, it's it's relatively new, I guess, sort of um, in the big picture. Yeah. In the grand scheme of museums, especially, we're we're a young museum, you know. We yeah. just turned what twenty five years old, twenty six years old. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, there's a lot of facets to the museum, and I think the education part of it, from looking at your website and and kind of digging in more, uh, is really mm-hmm. cool. Um, so so why don't you tell us about your job as director of education? Um, what what do you do in that role? Uh, well, I always tell people that it's. Uh, it's not just a dream job. It's like probably 20 of my top 25 <laughs> dream jobs. I get to do them all at the museum. Uh, so cool. I get to oversee our whole education department, all of our uh, free online sources. So if you're a teacher, you know, check out rockhall.com slash education. You can sign up for a free account. Uh, I also oversee our on-site programs. And mm-hmm. we serve everyone from pre-kindergarten all the way through college. So we kind of run the whole gamut. Uh, Then I also get to be in charge of our interactive instrument exhibit, the garage, where anyone can come and uh, rock out on an instrument, regardless of whether you have picked up an instrument before ever in your life. (laughs) Uh, We can get you rocking out within a few minutes. Uh, And then as the the resident drummer, I get to do all kinds of fun things like uh, I got to build Keith Moon's Pictures of Lily drum set uh, when it was on exhibit a couple years ago. Uh, when Kirk and Rob of Metallica were here, but Lars was not here, they wanted to jam. And I, so I got to live out my <laughs> lifelong dream of being the drummer for Metallica for like five minutes. And Oh uh, my gosh. What was that like? That had to be <gasps> nerve wracking. It was, <laughs> it was nerve wracking, but it was also super fun because they're just really cool dudes and they just wanted to jam and have fun. Uh, yeah. so it was, I say it was the best professional moment of my life, <laughs> hands down. Absolutely. And you said it, I should have mentioned it before. You are a drummer, which, you know, by definition, mm-hmm. your job doesn't mean that you have to be a drummer because you obviously deal with mm-hmm. a large array of instruments and collectibles and stuff. But, um, like you told me before, you are a drummer, punk, prog, rock, alternative, uh, sounds like a little mm-hmm. bit of everything, um, which really came in handy that day with Metallica. <laughs> uh, it sure did. And it's just it's come in handy, you know, managing that garage space. Uh, I'm also, you know, uh, an amateur at many of the other rock instruments, but drumming. I'm a drummer at heart, and that's definitely my best instrument. Yeah. And that's why you're really, uh, you know, specifically on this this show today, which um, I got to say thank you to Matt Brennan, who's been on the podcast a few times. He did a two parter on, I believe it was the history of working drummers or something along those lines. Um, And you're you're contributing to the book, which would be the Cambridge companion to the drum kit. Correct. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's out now. Oh, cool. 
Awesome. Mm -hmm. So people can check that out. But I think a lot of people know Matt in the drum world and stuff. So thank you to Matt for connecting us. But um, all right. Why don't we just hop in here then with um, you sent some great bullet points, which are very helpful. So um, drummers in the first couple classes of inductees. Talk about that. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting when you look at it, actually, um, you know, a lot of people point to 1988, which was the third uh, induction ceremony as being the first drummers. But if you actually go back to the first year, James Brown was inducted. And although we don't think of him as primarily a drummer, yeah. he is a drummer. So if you totally. think about it, James Brown was the first drummer ever inducted into the rock hall. Wow. Uh, then wow. in 87, you actually get a few more of those. You get Marvin Gaye, Eddie Cochran, and Bo, Di Bo Diddley. Again, yeah. not known primarily as drummers, but definitely are drummers and obviously have a very keen sense of rhythm. Uh, but then 1988, you get you start to get drummers, drummers, you know, people that are inducted for being drummers. Hmm. Uh, and the, the first two are Ringo Starr and Dennis Wilson, because you get the oh, Beatles wow. and you get the Beach Boys in in 1988. So they are. And just to kind of clarify that. So they're inducted. Um, their bands are inducted. Correct. So the Beach Boys and the Beatles would be inducted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ergo, those two drummers are then officially inducted as well. Um, cause like, I guess each member would mm -hmm. be inducted. You know what I mean? Like how you kind of yeah. classify it. And, and, and sometimes, you know, uh, some members will or won't be inducted based on how long they were in the band, how important they were to the band. So, you know, if someone, if a band started in the sixties and they had the same drummer until, uh, the nineties and then their last two years, they had a, a, a drummer, that drummer might not be inducted. Gotcha. Uh, but usually the the core, the key members of a band all get inducted. I'm sure that raises some issues. I, I feel like there's um, oh, yeah. <laughs> there are some uh, just some some tension that can come with the rock hall and who's inducted and who's not inducted, mm -hmm. and, uh, which, you know, it's all from an outsider. It all adds to the fun of like the um, the drama of it. But I'm sure. On the inside, it can be a little like, again, just uh, drive you nuts that people are upset that this guy wasn't and this girl was. And it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it can be. And it's interesting, though. I always try to look at it because, um, you know, people love to love the Rock Hall, but they also love to hate the Rock Hall sometimes. And what that tells me is we're doing something important. You know, people care yeah. about this music so much and they care so much about what band members are inducted with what bands and what order different bands get inducted in and things like that. So I try yeah. to put a positive spin on it and look at it like people really care about what we are doing. Yeah, it almost has like uh, kind of a parallel to like sports or something where like people love it mm -hmm. so much and then they get someone like a trade goes bad and I'm like the least sports guy in the world. But like it, <laughs> it just seems to uh, really get people's passions worked up um, <laughs> big time. But mm -hmm. so Ringo and Dennis Wilson, both of which I think are interesting because they're not the, um, you know, blow chops kind of drummers. They're they're band drummers, really. Mm -hmm. And especially Dennis Wilson is especially interesting because you know, he's a very good drummer. Uh, I don't think anyone would deny that, but he rarely makes like, you know, top 25 drummers of all time yeah. lists or anything yeah. like that. Whereas Ringo often does. I mean, he's still a very yeah. much a band drummer, but he was so just creative in the yeah. beats he chose to use and such a influence on, on future drummers. But uh, that just kind of shows yeah. you how different the rock hall is from something like, you know, the, the modern drummer hall of fame. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And Dennis Wilson, I, I'm not the expert on this at all, but it's interesting because, I mean, famously, Howell Blaine played drums on a lot of the recordings. So then that's mm -hmm. another like um, just another layer to go <laughs> deeper of like, how does it all work? But I'm, I'm sure you guys have plenty yeah. of things figured out with all that. But um, so and, uh, Hal Blaine is inducted, too, but he doesn't oh, get cool. inducted until... Let me find my notes. The year 2000, and he gets inducted in the the sidemen category, which is kind of like 
uh, people who, you know, contributed to rock and roll, but weren't really like in bands getting inducted. So people like That's Hal interesting. Blaine, uh, Betty Benjamin, Earl Palmer, DJ Fontana, people yeah. like that. Yeah. Which is great because those, those guys, and I'm sure girls too, you, you, you don't want to leave them out. You don't want to be like, well, you're not, no. um, like, I feel like there's categories in the Grammys and the Oscars and things where it's like, uh, you, your, your album is not country enough to be country, but it's not pop enough to be pop. So you yeah. get nothing. <laughs> you get nothing. <laughs> you get, yeah, you're done. Um, all right. Well then let's talk about, um, female drummers and you wrote in parentheses or lack thereof, mm-hmm. because that's, uh, you yourself are obviously a very rocking female drummer, but like, that's a thing in mm-hmm. our world of, um, I think it's getting better, I hope. Um, but maybe yeah. not in the big, I mean, I think of the rock hall is like the top of, um, being, um, recognized and we call it so, rock's highest honor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. So what's yeah. up with, uh, women in the rock hall? Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting because if, it does make sense, of course, that there would be more men inducted than women because there have been more men drummers uh, throughout history. And especially uh, with our one hard and fast rule is it has to be 25 years after your first record release. So we're just now getting into the, mm. the period where 90s bands are becoming eligible. Uh, but I still think I hope we start inducting more women musicians, women drummers, because right now we actually have two women drummers inducted into the rock hall. Is it, uh, what, oh, what's her name from the, from the Go-Go's? Um, she was number two, Gina Shock. She Gina just Shock. got in last year. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. Okay, who's the other and one? And then uh, the first one ever was uh, Mo Tucker of the Velvet Underground. Okay. You know, I think Karen Carpenter, I mean, I'm sure, yes. you know, she, you know, <laughs> Run that up the flagpole and say Bart sent uh, his suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I will, no. and I totally agree. I mean, yeah. Karen Carpenter is such a killer drummer. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, even out of those other two who are phenomenal drummers, but Karen Carpenter is like a, uh, I mean, just a a solo. She's she's a play chops, go nuts kind of drummer, um, as opposed to she's great in the band, great singer. Um, interesting story there as well, but yeah, Mm -hmm. that's, uh, I'm I'm sure it'll change. I, like you said, which it's interesting to hear about how the band, it has to be 25 years from the first, the album release, the first album, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think female drummers started to pop up more in the, um, in the nineties, I would say that's fair to say. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, and even more so with female bassists, which there are actually only two of those in the Rock Hall, too. But I bet we especially see more of them coming up in, in the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. I need to keep in mind that it's like, oh, yeah, we're not just we're, we're talking about drummers primarily. But really, in the big picture, we're talking about the bands and the musicians and um, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. OK, so. um What about so next we have big name drummers induction timeline. Um, Talk about that. Yeah, I was looking at some of the, you know, the people that do make the top drummers of all time lists and just kind of looking at when they got inducted. And so you have, uh, you know, a few in the 80s. You've got Ringo Starr in 88, Mm -hmm. Keith Watts, or I'm sorry, Charlie Watts in uh, 1989. Uh, but then in the 90s, you start getting some more. So you get Keith Moon inducted with The Who in 1990, Ginger Baker with Cream in 1993. Hmm. Uh, then Bonham finally gets in in 1995 with uh, Led Zeppelin. Uh, and so then you start to get a lot of those, you know, big 70s drummers, <laughs> yeah. which makes sense. Because, of course, you're going to get those in the mid 90s. Yeah. yeah uh, that but, time, but that, then, because of that timeline, like you said, which... Again, I've always wondered, yeah. how does this work? How how are they choosing these people? But that helps narrow it down where there's a bit of a funnel of it just you can't because I almost I honestly just thought it was like, um, let's just pull some names out of a hat or something. But there is a bit of a structure, obviously, of course. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting. I've learned much more about that process since working here. And it's it's really an involved, well thought out process where like. Uh, th- there are 30 or so people on the nominating committee every year and they get in a room and have a meeting basically all day 
where they each bring a couple names to the table of artists they think should be on the ballot. And then they, you know, all make their arguments about who it should be. And they don't leave that room until they have the ballot of usually like 11 to 19 people. Hmm. Now, how does it work with there's some years where I hear about the inductees and I think to myself, like, that's not exactly rock and roll or which is, again, totally fine. You guys know what you're doing. But like, how would it work with like a drummer like, let's say, Buddy Rich or something like that? I mean, Mm -hmm. not that I, I even think Buddy wouldn't you know, he'd be honored, but he'd probably be like, I don't play rock and roll (laughs) or something like that. How does that work with like the guys like that who Mm -hmm. are phenomenal, famous, maybe one of the most famous drummers in in history? Um, How does does he have any chance of getting in if he's not already in or something? You know, how does that work? I think he does. And I would love to see especially like a Gene Krupa. in. I mean, he had exactly so much to do, not just with music, but just making the drum set what it needed to be for rock and roll to be able to exist. Uh, You know, working with with Zildjian and and, uh, Slingerland and things like that to just make drum hardware what it needed to be. Uh, But neither of them are in yet. But I think if they did get in, they would get in in one of the sort of special categories. So we have Mm -hmm. um, that Sidemen category that later became changed to the Award for Musical Excellence. But then we also have an early influence category. And that's where I think someone like a Buddy Rich or Gene Krupa could be in because jazz is obviously a root of rock and roll that leads into rock and roll. And so, you know, we already have um, Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton and uh, Mahalia Jackson and Jimmy Rogers and Hank Williams in that category. Um, And I would like to see some more jazz in that category. I feel like um, we could we could definitely have some more jazz in there. Uh, But we get the question all the time, like, oh, why is so-and-so on the ballot? Um, You know, this year's ballot just got announced uh, maybe last week, and it's got Mm -hmm. everybody from Tribe Called Quest to Eminem to Dolly Parton to the MC5 uh, to the Eurythmics on it. And uh, really, there's so many ways you can define rock and roll, but we define it as broadly as possible. So we think of rock and roll as sort of like the trunk of a tree. And it has all these roots, country music, doo-wop, Tin Pan Alley, uh, rhythm and blues. But it also has all these branches like funk and disco. And then they branch off even further to become hip hop. And then there's sort of uh, garage rock, which turns into punk music and things like this. And we really want to celebrate all of that music because we see it all as being interrelated throughout the history of the 20 and 21st centuries. Obviously, that is something, though, that I'm sure leads to controversy where people go, why is Eminem yes. being inducted? That that clearly is something that uh, for people who that irks them, um, that's yeah. got to be one of those points where, you know, again, but you're you're trying to really highlight and um, raise up these people who are influential in, in a lot of genres. So mm-hmm. I say more power to you. Um, people work hard and, and it's it's just like a. You know, it's it's such an honor for any any musician of any kind to be inducted. So why not? Why not include everyone? <laughs> you know, so. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Drummers who are uh, inducted two times. This is an interesting category that you sent over. Um, that's fascinating. So give a couple examples of that. There are actually only a couple examples of that. Okay, um, good. <laughs> but I think there could be more in the future. Uh, so right now, Ringo is inducted twice. He's inducted with the Beatles. And then he actually got the award for musical excellence for um, the huge impact he's had on rock history, not just through the Beatles, but also through, I mean, he really changed the game in terms of sort of like his all-star band and the idea of sort of like a legacy tour and musicians getting back together. Um, So he kind of changed the music industry in several ways. Uh, And then the other one is Dave Grohl, who was inducted with Nirvana as a drummer, but then he also got in with the Foo Fighters. So not mainly as a drummer because he's, you know, more of their uh, singer, songwriter, guitarist, but you know, we know he does play drums on some of the tracks and things like that. Yeah. But I think there could be other people in the future. I mean, Bill Bruford is in with yes, but when King Crimson gets in, he could be a two-timer. 
Yeah. Uh, Matt Cameron's in with Pearl Jam. If Soundgarden gets in, which I really hope they do, he would be a totally. key timer. Yeah. Interesting. God, God, sometimes you don't realize that these uh, musicians have played with you. You kind of you you don't really realize the impact of playing with two of some of the biggest bands in the world. Like Lightning has struck twice for yeah. some of these people. Wow. It really, um, really has. So um, who do you want to see uh, inducted on, on you know, your list of, of drummers that you're, you're into and you like? Uh, that's a good question. I, I do feel like Gene Krupa is mm-hmm. near the top of my list. Just I feel like he had such an impact on, like I said, making the drum set and drumming style what it needed to be for rock and roll to be able to even exist. Um, yeah. I'd like to see some other, you know, old jazz drummers in too, but I'd also like to see, uh, you know, more women in. I'd love to see the Runaways get uh, mm-hmm. in. Uh, I'd love to see, you know, some of these 90s bands. I'm a huge Patty Schemmel fan. Uh, yeah. The first time I heard Hole in the 90s, that was the first time I heard a woman drummer just beating the life out of the drums, you know, and that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's then, so cool. Uh, I, I think I also have to throw in rage against the machine who is actually on the ballot again this year, but I Brad is just, Oh, he is just yeah. a monster drummer. I've never seen a drummer have such volume, but also such funky groove and be able to do both of yeah. those things so well absolutely i have tickets from 2020 that got postponed or was it 2021 they got postponed and then i just got an yeah. email like two days ago or no no not two days like like two weeks ago saying they're postponed again from 2022 oh, so it's happening like no. in 2023 so it's like oh my god i just want to see rage in uh that's in yeah. detroit um which which is pretty close to you um yeah, and I have tickets to another one of their shows, but I I don't think I got the update yet about the it yet was like again the first postponed. It was like the first half of the tour. So after a certain day, it it uh, uh-huh. they were like, all right, we'll do the tour after. I think it was in um, gosh, in the summer it continues on like normal. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, mm-hmm. Brad Wilk and Rage that would be an awesome one. But but it raises the question of like, would Rage want to do it because? You know what I mean? They're like sort of uh-huh. they need to be raging against some type of a machine and maybe the rock hall would be the machine. But I think yeah. it's such an honor. Um, I don't know. I think who knows? You don't know. But but yeah, Rage, I actually and talked to Brad, briefly talked to Brad Wilk. He ooh, started nice. following me on Instagram and I messaged him and said, I just I don't do this often, but I got to tell you, I love I grew up loving Rage. And he went like, oh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. And I was like, it's all worth it <laughs> up to this. Point. That's so cool. Yeah. I wonder. I bet they would come just because. And I, I've had the same thoughts. I, I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure, but Zach De La Rocha did come and actually induct Patty Smith when she got into the Rock Hall. And cool. I feel like he would be the one who would most likely be like, "No, we're not doing this, guys." <laughs> yeah. But if he came and inducted Patty Smith, maybe they would come. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean, it's a very cool and um, uh, it's just different than. I mean, it's a museum. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's has a lot of history and, and which kind of leads me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is, uh, the museum and things that are on, um, display and what people can expect if they go there. And maybe if people geographically in another country never have any chance to go, maybe you can describe what it's like. I mean, everyone kind of knows, I think that it's a gigantic pyramid shaped building, um, which you can't really miss. Uh, which I don't know if you know history about the building itself. I mean, that's pretty iconic that, that, that shape. Yeah. And it was, it was designed by I.M. Pei, who also designed the Louvre. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, Very cool. And we're actually getting ready to build on and build on a new expansion, uh, to actually make the museum even bigger, which is very exciting. Wow. Uh, so stay tuned. More to come on that. Uh, we have not broken ground yet, so we'll we'll see. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. But all right. So so maybe, again, describing to people who who won't be able to go there, like what mm-hmm. can you typically see? Like I remember looking at like 
uh, handwritten like John Lennon, like lyrics. And, you know, yeah. there's Jimi Hendrix's pants or something like that. There's all this kind of <laughs> c- cool stuff. So I don't know. You walk through the door and then what do you mm-hmm. see? Take it from there. Yeah. So you see uh, seven floors worth of exhibits and artifacts um, that are arranged uh, according to different themes. So right now, right when you walk in, the first thing you see is our It's Been Said All Along exhibit, uh, which we made in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd and all of the, you know, just horrible things that were happening in terms of race relations in 2020. Uh, So it is really all about how black musicians have been responding to racism and injustice throughout the whole history of rock and roll. So that is currently one of my favorite exhibits. Uh, then as you go through our main exhibit hall, it's, you know, starts with the roots of rock and roll and ends with our right here, right now exhibit and just sort of tells the story of different styles and movements in rock. Uh, then um, on in different parts of the museum, we have rotating exhibits that come and go. Uh, so right now we have a great Legends of Rock exhibit on floors four, five, and six that just has some really iconic uh, instruments. Uh, drummers would be interested in, we have a whole like uh, little display on the roots and we have this great quest love drum kit that awesome. uh, like each drum has different panels on it that has like it's one finish and then another finish and another finish like between each of the lugs. Oh, cool. I've never seen anything like that. It looks super awesome. It kind of sounds like uh, the Ludwig. I forget the exact name, but like the salesman special or whatever. I forget. Someone huh. else is going to be screaming at their podcast at their phone right now, yelling the name <laughs> of it. But I think it's it's the salesman and the uh, the drummer Gosh, from the Black Keys, whose name is escaping me right now. Um, he uh, Ohio it's, it's yeah, yes, Ohio, it's Can- Canton, <laughs> Canton or Akron. Um, but it would be strips of the different finishes, so the drum, mm. uh, the the retail, the salesman could go around and just show one drum. Uh, I if that's, but it almost you could be describing something totally different. But that is a Ludwig thing. But um, mm. that's that's cool. So so I'm also interested as we're talking about the museum, all of this stuff from these great drummers. Is it all donated? Does the Rock Hall purchase some of this stuff? You know, how's that work? That's a good question. Since we are a nonprofit, we don't buy a lot just because we don't have the funds to compete with private collectors oh, yeah. who could spend $3 million on Jimi Hendrix's guitar. So we yeah. rely on uh, people who do have $3 million to spend on Jimi Hendrix's guitar, loaning it to us so that they can share it with the world and we can put it on display. Uh, we also get lots of loans from the artists themselves and from their estates. Mm. Uh, And then sometimes we get donations from them as well. Like, hey, we want this to live on forever. You know, I know this guitar is an important part of history. I'm giving it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, And then we also have uh, some relationships with other museums where uh, sometimes we will um, get a traveling exhibit from them or give them a traveling exhibit, something like that. So it comes from a lot of, uh, you know, really different. It comes in from a lot of different ways. Yeah, because I I hear these stories of, um, you know, someone buying Ringo's bass drum head for millions of dollars from Ed Sullivan. And it's like, you know, that does belong in a museum, but your guys' competition almost is the eccentric millionaire who's buying things up. Mm -hmm. And it does, you know, it's just sort of, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. If I was an eccentric millionaire, I'd be buying, (laughs) you know, awesome gear all the time. Me too. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but but you know, it's good to know. It makes sense that they buy it and then instead of it just sitting in their office, they share it with the Rock Hall and I'm sure it gets a little tag or whatever mm-hmm. like a plaque or something that says um but is security a big thing there? Of course, I'm sure everything is locked up and safe and, and yeah. yeah. And security is there 24/7. So we're only closed 2 days a year, but security is there on Christmas day. <laughs> You know, making sure that everything yeah. is okay and uh, and not just security, but also, you know, we have like this whole humidifier system that we have to keep everything at the right humidity and uh, climate control and, and things like that. So it's a pretty complicated but interesting process to preserve the materials. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had that you can speak of any of like these like I think of like the Thomas Crown affair or something, these like situations <laughs> where someone's like sneaking in trying to steal 
Jimi Hendrix's pants or whatever it is. Like they're trying to like not slip that, out with uh not that I know of, but I feel like we should write a movie about that. I feel like that would be really fun. I would yes. totally watch that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um all right. So then you being the director of education, you talked about it before about what you do, but um so obviously you probably work with a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. Is this the local Cleveland neighborhood? Like, you know, people people come in and they a lot of school trips. What's your day to day like? Yeah, so we have a lot of different programs. We have a toddler rock program, which is adorable, where three to five year olds come yeah. in every single week and work with a team of music therapists to learn their letters. But you know, they're learning the letter A through dancing to Aretha Franklin's music and and things like that. Cool. Um, then we have a uh, uh, what we call Rock in the Schools, which is our kindergarten through 12th grade field trip program where kids uh, come in from their school or their classroom and uh, take an educational program with us and uh, do activities around the museum. And then we also partner with our local uh, Cuyahoga Community College and offer a history of rock and roll course. So, you know, you can take rock history and the museum is your classroom. Um, yeah. but then also, you know, we have relationships with different sort of scholarly organizations like the American Musicological Society. So we have musicologists come and lecture. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have that online platform, which serves pre-kindergarten through college as well. Um, so all kinds of things. And I guess one of the one yeah. of the funnest classes I had though is I was doing this program in the museum just for regular visitors, and a whole charter of Hell's Angels came in and they were <laughs> my students for like 15 minutes and they were wild. It was so much fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. So <laughs> I you bet you didn't know. expect that coming from <laughs> Coming from like toddlers learning their letters to Hell's Angels. Uh, <laughs> yep, that's, that's the great. Rock and roll so it, <laughs> it, it is. Now, are you involved? Obviously, the education thing is obviously different from from the event. I feel like people kind of think of the Rock Hall for that that one day where it's the you know it's aired on TV. It's the the induction ceremony. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess first, have you been to the ceremony? I know the tickets are supposed to be super expensive and you know hard to get. You know, I've been every year that I've worked here. So I started going in awesome. uh, twenty sixteen or something like that. Uh, it's cool. it's an amazing night because you just see people on stage together that you would literally never see on stage together anywhere else. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. I mean, that is just such it's a pretty long event, right? I mean, give mm-hmm. us the whole rundown of, of that. Like, I mean, are, are a lot of celebrities and stuff are in the audience. <laughs> you just It has to be mind blowing, I'm sure. It really is mind blowing, especially when it's in Cleveland, because sometimes those celebrities will stop by and tour the museum beforehand. And so you really just never know what is going to happen induction weekend. Uh, and it's just great to mm. see. uh Cause I don't even know some of the surprise guests who are going to be there. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm totally surprised by somebody coming out on stage and um, especially this past year was just, it's the most star studded thing I have ever seen or been involved with in my life. Like hands down. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you said if it's not in Cleveland, where is, where do they, where else do they hold it? Uh, Usually it's like every other year, Cleveland, New York, Cleveland, New York, but okay. uh, sometimes that changes. Okay. We've had a few out in LA too. Uh, sure. Yeah. That makes mm-hmm. sense. All right. And now I got to ask the question. I, I feel like I know as a Ohioan because it's a good state and all this stuff. Why is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio? That is a great question and one that we get a lot. Uh, so <laughs> ever since they founded the Rock Hall in the 80s. They wanted there to be a museum somewhere. And so, uh, but they wanted that museum to be in a city that was really important to early rock and roll, like in the 1950s. And so they came up Mm -hmm. with a list of cities like New Orleans and Memphis and Chicago. And Cleveland was on that list because uh, a lot of people don't know the first, what most people consider to be the first rock and roll concert ever happened in Cleveland, Ohio. It was called the Moondog Coronation Ball. And there were all these early rock and roll, doo-wop, 
you know, kind of groups there. And it was so rock and roll that they actually accidentally oversold it and it got shut down like after the first song. So it was so rock and roll that it didn't even really happen. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty rock and roll right there <laughs> that it gets shut down. <laughs> and then also, wow. um, Alan Freed is a DJ who uh, was in Cleveland, Ohio for a long time. And while he was in Cleveland, he is credited as, as the first person to take the words rock, roll, put them together and use it to refer to that specific style of music. So that's why mm. Cleveland was mm. on the list to begin with. And then it was just a combination of uh, we had people who were our city was willing to put up the money to have the museum built here. But also um, I believe it was time magazine put out a poll saying, where should the rock hall be in one of these seven or eight cities? And one thing that I've learned since moving here is Clevelanders love their rock and roll more than anyone loves rock and roll on the planet. <laughs> And so, you know, it was the eighties or nineties. So people called into time magazine and Cleveland just blew it out of the water. Everyone was like, it has to be in Cleveland. It has to be in Cleveland. And so wow. we put it in Cleveland. <laughs> Cleveland is cool. I've been yeah. a few times. Um, I'm about four hours south because I'm right on the border of Kentucky and uh, Ohio. But um, Cleveland, it's similar to Cincinnati. I feel like a lot of these mm -hmm. Ohio kind of like, I guess you'd say river cities are, um, you know, they have a similar feel. Um, but I definitely like Cleveland. Um, what are your thoughts, totally unrelated, as a Cleveland, you know, person about the the Bengals being in the Super Bowl? Are you guys happy that it's an Ohio team or would you rather it be the, the Browns? Yeah. So I'm like probably the worst person to ask that question because I'm not a I am too. sports person. Uh, but I, I am now. <laughs> I think people seem like kind of excited. They're talking about it. So that's good. Yeah. Um, but Clevelanders yeah. do love they love their home teams, you know, they love the Browns exactly. so much. Yep. Yeah, we we in Cincinnati climbed our way out of the uh, 30 years of disappointment. Uh, <laughs> again, not a big football guy, but you uh -huh. sure as hell become one when you're going to the Super Bowl in a, in a week. Um, but that's probably the first and last time football will be talked about on this um, podcast, <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> So um, where are you from originally? You said you're not. So you you moved to Cleveland for this job to to work there. I actually moved to Cleveland to uh, get my Ph.D. where uh, I, I went okay, to Case cool. Western and actually wrote my dissertation on rock drumming, uh, which was really wow. exciting. And then uh, while I was sort of in the middle of that process, a job at the Rock Hall opened up and I was like, I have to that has to be my job. And now I'm going to be a lifelong Clevelander because I. Can't imagine that's leaving. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, writing your dissertation about that, that's an interesting about rock drumming. You, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people um, who have sent me messages and stuff saying, hey, I'm writing it about double drumming up to double bass drumming, which is one that I'm going to actually have him on the episode, uh, do an episode soon. But mm -hmm. um, that's cool you did it, your you know dissertation on rock drumming because it's not – you think people do jazz or I've, mm -hmm. I've talked to people who did uh, – Colleen Clark did the – history of the jazz ride pattern what was the if you had to summarize it in a you know a couple minutes what would be what was your takeaway from doing your dissertation on rock drumming yeah so basically what i was looking at is um the concept of the primitive which is a pretty problematic concept uh but that often gets you know mapped onto drummers if you think of like mm -hmm. uh muppets animal i've got my <laughs> tattoo right here yes um, <laughs> there you go but then you think of the concept of the virtuosic, someone who's just really a master at their instrument. Um, and you think of that as sort of being like highbrow. And you think of the primitive as kind of lowbrow. But in drumming, yeah. those things often happen at the same time. If you think about Keith Moon, no one embodies the primitive more than Keith Moon. And he's such a virtuosic yeah. drummer. And so I really kind yeah. of dug into what makes drumming so special that these two things that we wouldn't think of as overlapping so often overlap in drumming. And so it, it kind of goes through uh, a lot of different drummers and sort of talks about those concepts uh, separately, but then also kind of talks about them together too. I mean, if you had to say, you know, if you're on the elevator with someone, what was your result? Like, what would you say is the final result of like, there's just something in our brains that make us think like that? Or 
what was your final sentence of the thesis? <laughs> um, well, I think it just has to do with really kind of the concept of Africa. And so sure. we often, for better or worse, kind of paint drums as originating in Africa and originating with these quote unquote primitive people, um, which if, you know, you know anything about Africa, it is not just filled with a bunch of primitive people in the year 2022. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But then you get a lot of types of African drumming that are highly virtuosic. And so it, it's yeah. kind of even in drumming history before we get to rock and roll that those concepts uh, kind of overlap with one another. And, and then on top of that, in sort of like the Western world, we like to privilege thinking about pitch and melody and harmony over thinking about things like rhythm and timbre. So then when something yeah. like rhythm or timbre becomes really to the expert level, it's just this clash of values um, that breaks our brains. And that's yeah. one of the things that makes drumming amazing. Yeah. You know, and I, I, it's, to not go digging into my phone, into my messages, I did, I can't remember who it was. I was talking with someone about, he sent me a really cool message that was talking about how, um, like we all know, and Matt Brennan talked about on on his, epi uh, his episode early on, was um, drummers, we get this connotation of being idiots mm -hmm. or you're just hitting things, which is so, uh, you know, wrong. But what this person said, and I'm again, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was. They said... Um, Everyone he's talked, he said, everyone he's ever talked to, everyone, which I thought was cool, that he's heard on this podcast, um, are all incredibly nice and extremely intelligent, yourself obviously included, Thank you. <laughs> and very, very passionate, and uh, are the opposite of that. So it's almost to say that, like, of course, okay, that stupid stereotype of drummers just hitting stuff and drooling and <laughs> all yeah. that stuff, but it goes the opposite way where they're actually very nice and very kind and happy to help people mm -hmm. and uh, even doing interviews. People just be like, uh, you know, I'll talk to someone briefly and then the next thing I know, there's like, they sent like a hat or something, just something like that where it's like you like go over the top with the friendliness, mm -hmm. but also it's just, you speak to them and they're just, uh, a lot of drummers too, their day job will be, um, oh, I'm an accountant or, oh, I'm a, I'm a surgeon or I'm a yeah. doctor. I was one person. It's like, I'm a priest. And it's like, <laughs> I, there's no rules for our, um, you know, what makes a drummer a drummer. And that goes for men and women, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, sometimes I'll read about even just a famous person who I find out is a drummer. Like, did you know Tipper Gore is a drummer? No. That's crazy, no, right? And you gotta, yeah, you got to, like, imagine that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, all right, so you're the you're the, the history expert. Wasn't Tipper Gore, didn't she lead the, like, the censorship like The PMRC battle? hearings yeah. in the 1980s? I think so, yeah. And so it's, it's so interesting then, that then she is... A drummer. <laughs> yeah. Not to say that she didn't go home and like put on like Glenn Campbell or something who Glenn Campbell's great, but would just rock out to something very wholesome. Yeah. As opposed she didn't go home and listen to like rat and then like play the drums to it. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no. But you do um, Rosie O'Donnell. Um, mm. Shaka Khan's a great drummer. There was a mm -hmm. one about female drummers sort of recently, but it. It, uh, you know, John Stewart, I was listening to another podcast recently, and a lot of times I'll hear that, like, um, famous, you know, TV hosts or whatever, huh. they go home and play the drums. Well, of course they do. It's a relaxing and honestly, yeah. not putting us down at all. I think the barrier of entry is easier on the drums than it is to pick up a guitar or piano. Yeah. And because if you think about it, and, and I would say it's like, Drums are the e easiest, then piano, then guitar, because like, yeah, you all the time are holding things like this and you all the time are like hitting different things in your childhood and you're as an adult, you're hitting hammers. So just that yeah. sort of muscle memory is so easy. I cannot think of another time in your life where you curve your hand like this and push things down awkwardly with one hand and yeah. then do something completely different with another hand. So, you know, in that garage yeah. exhibit where we're teaching people how to play, uh, 
people have the most success with the drums, second most with keyboards, because again, we're typing every day, right? We're used to doing yeah. this with our fingers, but then sure. guitars are hard for people to learn. It's frustrating. Oh, and on top of that, it's your hand isn't used to being like this position. It's going to hurt for the first month. Yeah. <laughs> like you're... <laughs> Your fingers are going to be sore and then they're going to like turn different colors as you're playing more. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know that that garage exhibit you're you're saying sounds like a really cool thing. Do you ever get like absolute chaos where again, for as a, as a former high school um, guitar center employee? It, sometimes you would want to just go over and just like shake them and be like, stop playing right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes it gets a little wild in there. If we have a, a big group of people, especially a big group of really excited young kids. Uh, and it, uh, we do have like the real deal equipment in there. We've got Gibsons and Fenders and, you know, it's not like we have Squires. We have, you know, like Stratocasters. Um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's, we wanted to make it the real deal. We wanted to give kids that, that opportunity to experience what, what rock and roll is and, and that experience to then have the rest of the museum come, al come alive. Cause if you beat drums in the garage and then go look at Keith Moon's pictures of Lily kit, you could imagine what it was like to be Keith Moon playing that drum kit. Yeah. And you know, I mean, that just uh, for me personally, from doing this podcast for so long now, I see, the the world i see things differently where if i look mm -hmm. at like um i don't know you're obviously the same way everyone listening to this podcast is probably the same way where if you go to a concert mm -hmm. you're not just listening to the music it's like you could stand before the concert starts and just examine everything on stage yeah. <laughs> and be just as happy with that like looking at the guys or girls bass rig or <laughs> even if it's not your instrument you're just like it's gear it's cool mm -hmm. but i think from doing some history research, going to the rock hall, which I, I absolutely, I'm going to make it once. I mean, I guess, have you guys had COVID restrictions kind of on the, on that note or how's that worked out? Yeah. We still have a mask policy in place uh, where all guests are required to wear a mask. Um, sure. We have enhanced cleaning, things like that. We, we're keeping our capacity lower, but this time of year, that's not, you know, not everyone is, to, you know, coming to Cleveland in February, as you might imagine. So it's one of our <laughs> no. slower oh my months God. here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's been a very safe place to be. I'm really grateful because I hear about, you know, other people that have other jobs that maybe aren't taking us as, as seriously. I feel like we have just been consistently at the forefront of COVID safety. Yeah. I mean, in my experience with going to museums here in Cincinnati, um, like I'll take my son who's two and we'll run mm -hmm. around, um, uh, Union Terminal is a big if museum like here, podcast, which was actually the, find me on social what the media Justice at Drum History and League, please share like rate the building that was designed after. And let me know topics that fact, you would like to learn about in the future. It, I think most museums, it's Until kind of understood. Time, you wear a mask. It's just kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing political about it or anything. But um, all right. So as we get kind of close to the end here, y you personally or anything, do you want to share some like where they can find out more about the rock hall or if you're playing in any bands or albums, anything you have that you want to promote now would be the time. Sure. Uh, you can find lots of stuff at rockhall.com. And even if you are, you know, in another country and never plan on going to the U S we have a lot of our exhibits online now, you know, that we put online during COVID. So we have virtual exhibits of the, it's been said all along exhibit that I spoke about earlier and some other exhibits. Uh, I have to replug our, online education platform. It's for teachers, parents, guardians. I mean, I, I feel like everyone in the world became a teacher in the last two years. Um, and it has yeah. free resources that span pre-kindergarten through college where you can harness the power of rock and roll to teach anything from English to social studies, to music, to STEM topics. Um, and, and it's got a lot of great content. You know, we have and it's not me teaching about the drums. It's like Max Weinberg of the E Street Band teaching about the drums. So we have a lot of cool yeah. uh, exclusive artist content on there as well. So um, definitely check That's that out. Awesome. Cool. Well, this has been awesome. Um, Mandy has been kind enough uh, to hang out for a little extra after. And I think, Mandy, if it's OK with you, what I'd like to talk about is Maybe, like you said, Max Weinberg and these other guys, I, if you've had more interactions with some of these famous, you know, people coming through and drummers, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. 
And um, just maybe we can discuss a little bit about how you guys create this educational content. Um, I think that'd be a, a neat little extra topic for for the Patreon bonus episode, um, where if people want to listen to that, they can go to drumhistorypodcast.com, Patreon link, you can click it, two bucks a month and more, uh, you can sign up, which I'm sure people know about it, because I've been talking about it for a long time. But um, yeah, Mandy, thank you so much for being on the show. And and like I said, before I kind of diverted to the COVID stuff, I would love to make like a, a pilgrimage up, maybe not in February, yeah. Um, yeah. but <laughs> and come to the Rock Hall, because I have a, uh, a two-year-old who I think would enjoy it. I think I'd maybe enjoy it more just going alone and not chasing after a two-year-old. But um, if I do, I'd love to maybe link up with you and I can shoot some video and some photo for the podcast and we can um, do something cool. Absolutely. That would be a blast. We can, we can tour the museum and just look at all the drum stuff and then uh, we can take your kid up to the garage and uh, they can beat on some drums (laughs) and play some ukuleles. We even have like kid sized guitars and things like that. It'll, it'll be a blast. Very cool. All right, so everyone can uh, check out Rock Hall. Um, I, and again, just wherever you are, you can Google and get all the information. But um, like Mandy said, it is rockhall.com. And then on social media, it's Rock Hall, uh, just Rock Hall as at, well. Yeah, like hashtag right? Rock Hall, at Rock Hall, you know, at, at rock it's Rock Hall. Hall. It's all Rock yeah. Hall. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rock Hall. Cool. Well, Mandy, thank you for being here. And thanks again to Matt Brennan for connecting us. And uh, I had a blast yeah. talking to you about the Rock Hall. See you later. See ya.